And the reason I have the Nicene Creed written down here is there are going to be some parts of the Dream of the Root that I'm going to make connection to this. Um, not because I'm trying to beat it into your mind, but because the poet seems to have at least portions of this on his mind um, throughout it. Okay. Dream of the Rood is dream vision poem. Dream vision poems were very popular in the Middle Ages, late antiquity. Um, Chaucer has, you know, a couple of them in the Canterbury Tales. You have uh, in the manuscript that has Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, you have the Pearl Poem, which is a dream vision poem. Um, they, they figure pretty prominently in um, medieval literature. This poem is a bit different from all those others because it also is an example. I mean, written all that up there can't be that area. It's also an example of prosopopoeia. Prosopopoeia. P r o s o p o p o e i a. Got three p's. <laughs> okay. Um, what does that mean? An inanimate object speaks. Right? There are two other prosopopoeic poems in old, in old English. One's called The Husband's Message, where a piece of wood speaks. And I'm drawing a blank on another one. Anyways, so an inanimate object speaks. In this case, the cross of Christ. Right? Rude is just the old English word for um, cross. If you go into... Um, a cathedral in England today. Take my Harry Potter course in London this summer. Talk to me afterwards if you want about it. Um, four weeks in London. It's a great time. Um, but if you go into a cathedral in England today or into almost, almost but not quite, if you go into you know, several small churches, you will still see what's called the rude screen. Okay, And that is this... Um, Usually a wooden barrier between what is considered to be the name of the church and the sanctuary or the holy place, the area where the altar is. Okay, it's called the rude screen because originally this would have had a cross on it or multiple crosses. Okay, uh, you go way back and it would have had icons and, and um, such on it. And some of the churches still have these. Some of the cathedrals still have these. Okay. The poem is preserved in what's called the Vercelli Manuscript, V-E-R-C-E-L-L-I, in Vercelli, Italy. We're not really positive how the manuscript got to Italy, but it's been there for a long time, right? It's also preserved a portion of it, a few lines of it, on a large stone-carved cross in Dumfries, Scotland, this is the southwest area of Scotland, spelled the Ruthwell Cross, but it's pronounced Rivel, R I like R I V E L, Drivel without the D. Okay, the cross dates from the early eighth century, sometime between 700 725. Okay, there is some debate as to whether. The carving on the cross is coterminous, that is, timed with, synchronous with, the time that the cross was raised. There's really no good reason not to assume it wasn't carved. That is, these images were carved on it the same time that the cross was raised. The image is carved on it. It's got carvings on two of the wire faces, and the wire faces are like this wide. And the narrower faces are about six inches. So it's got imagery from the base of the cross almost to the top and then also along the arms. It's got inscriptions in Latin, kind of up one side and down the other side, etc. And in Old English runes. The Dream of the Rude portion is in Old English runes. Okay? 
And some of the images are, you know, Mary Magdalene, um, Mary and John at the foot of the cross, things like that. You can go and see it. Uh, it was broken during the period of the dissolution of the monasteries. The Protestants tried to destroy the cross. They th threw it down, broke it in two. A piece of it is missing. We're not sure exactly how much, but on the basis of, you know, uh, some basic geometry have a pretty good idea of you know, how much of it is um, missing. It's indoors now. The local church built in kind of a spot for it to be housed inside. Um, it had sat outside in the elements for apparently about a thousand years. You know, and 500 years after it was knocked down. 400 years after it was knocked down. Right? Um, and you've got a little image of it uh, there at the, off to the side of the introduction in your textbook. Okay, so, dream of the root. Listen, that's Old English, what, or what, okay? It doesn't fit metrically with anything else in the line. It, it, it doesn't serve a purpose metrically, that is, in terms of, Meter. What it's the point it serves. I have to remember to bring in a crystal goblet every time I do this for this one. The point it serves is kind of this. I know it doesn't just have the same effect, right? It's getting the attention of the people in the hall so that you'll see some people translate or you'll see some translations of it something like low. There's even a translation Beowulf begins with what? There's even a translation of Beowulf that begins with, yo! <laughs> Getting everybody's attention. Doesn't really fit the context, okay? But low is kind of, you know, archaic. So is the way some begin, okay? Listen, pay attention, okay? I will speak of the sweetest dream, what came to me in the middle of the night, when speech bearers slept in their rest, okay? Speech bearers. Old English is reord. I think it's berendra. Okay. Reord, this is voice or speech bearers. He translates it very literally, speech bearers. This is an example of a kidding. What is meant by it? Who are speech bearers? We are. Humans are. Okay? Cows aren't. Cows don't speak. They low and they moo, but they don't speak. Okay? So, a question I have is, why not translate the word as to what it means? So you know, the an audience would hear that rare berendra, they would understand, oh, this is a kidding, but they would also understand it to mean people. It means people. So what came to me in the, in the middle of the night when people sleep in their rest? That's all he's saying. It seemed, what kind of verb is seemed? It's subjunctive. It's condition. Contrary to fact. I'm going to use an example. Don't get offended because it's a condition contrary fact. Kim Kardashian seems like a wholesome person or a virtuous person. Not so much. Okay. Seems condition contrary to fact. So it seemed that I saw a most wondrous tree raised on high wound round with light. He means this is a vision, this is a dream. The scene means it's like it was real, but it's a dream. But it's not real. For those of you who are unfortunately in this and my Shakespeare class, you know, you heard us talking about Midsummer Night's Dream. It's all a dream. It doesn't really happen, so to speak. We're told at the epilogue at the end of the play. Why? Because it is a play. So, 
It seemed I saw a most wondrous tree raised on high, wound round with light, the brightest of beams. The brightest of beams. The word beam there is also, okay? It's not quite a kinny, but it's close to it. What kind of beam is he talking about? What is a beam made of? Wood. Wood. The brightest of beams means the brightest of trees, okay? So, all that beacon... Well, what's the difference between a beacon and a beam, or a beacon and a tree? What does a beacon do? Lights the way. Lights the way. It's like a lighthouse, right? It's like the light in a lighthouse. All that beacon, this thing giving off light, why? Because we're told it was wound round with light. Does that mean it's got like rope lights? You know? <laughs> no, it's like it has a halo, like it's giving off light. All that beacon was covered in gold. Well, why would a cross be covered in gold? I mean, during this period, Anglo-Saxon churches would have as instruments of worship, okay, you know, a gold chalice, a gold plate, gold crosses, gold coverings on their gospel books or their Bibles, etc. Why gold? Well, what's the purpose of every one of these things? Quote, unquote, holy, first of all. You're going to give Jesus, or you're going to give the king of the universe, something made out of just cowhide. I mean, are you going to use a cup for the Eucharistic meal to pour the quote-unquote blood of Christ into out of ceramic? I mean, really? No. Anything with Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. It, it's exactly it. No? <laughs> it's exactly it. So... Covered in gold, gems stood fair at the earth's corners, and there were five upon the crossbeam. Why are there gems standing fair at the earth's corners? And I thought the earth was round. How can the earth have corners? They didn't think the earth was square. Okay. What position oh, is the speaker in? Is he sleeping in a recliner? No, he's what? Lying flat. Okay. He looks up. He says, I see this cross. How big is the cross he sees? Touches the horizon at his feet. He looks farther back. Touches the horizon at his head. He looks to the west. If, he's, you know, if his feet are painting facing north. Looks to the west. The one arm of the cross is touching the horizon there. The other arm of the cross is touching. This is a stinking big cross. It covers the span of the sky. So the four corners are the four points where the wood cross touches, like a rainbow touches, the surface of the earth. Why does he see four gems there? Or why does he see gems there? Okay, we're told. Jim stood fair at the earth's corners, and there were five upon the crossbeam. Why five gems on the crossbeam? The five wounds of Christ. Okay. Which we're going to hear about again in Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Five wounds of Christ, the crown of thorns, nails in the hands, nails in the feet, spear in the side. Okay. The gems that he sees on the four points are probably, probably, blood, which we'll get to in just a moment. All the angels of the Lord looked on, fair through all eternity. And you've got a gloss there saying, you know, these lines are difficult, much debated. This is one reading of, it, of them. That was no felon's gallows. Well, who usually died in crucifixion? Criminals. Criminals. Okay. So the speaker says, this wasn't a criminal's gallows. Why? One, it's covered in gold and adorned with jewels. Hmm. But holy spirits beheld him there. Are the holy spirits the angels of the Lord? Because then we get men over the earth and this glorious creation. Or are we getting a listing there? Holy spirits beheld him, angels. Men over the earth beheld him, and all this glorious creation, does that refer to the earth itself? Might. What would all, however, tend to include? Everything. 
heaven, hell, everything. All of this glory is creation. Everything that's made. Wondrous was the victory tree. Now there's a new term, victory tree. Now cross isn't usually looked at as a symbol of victory because the guy who gets hanged on it isn't all that victorious. Not a nice way to die. How do you die from crucifixion? Suffocation. Why do you suffocate? Well, it's a hang dog. You can't raise your chest. Okay. To You're 95 percent of the way there. You don't have to bleed out. Well, I mean, you do bleed, but that's minor bleeding. I mean, you you can slit your wrist and yeah, still live. Okay. You can get nails through your wrist because the nail is here. It's not here. Why? Because this will rip through when something happens. See, the way you, the way crucifixion occurs is they lay the cross on the ground. The person is nailed to it there, okay, laying down. Then you take the cross and you hoist it up and you have a big hole in the ground. Like, you know, like you're putting holes for a post for a fence. Well, you dig that hole two to three feet deep. So when you set the cross up, what happens to the thing? Boom! It drops down into the ground. When it drops down into the ground and hits the ground, it drops two or three feet. You've got nails here. That doesn't pull through. Hurts like hell. <laughs> but what happens? You dislocate both shoulders. You dislocate both shoulders, and now you can't expand your lungs all the way. All you can do is go. <sighs> but you can get just enough breath to live a long time. You ultimately die of suffocation, though. Right? Not a pleasant way. So, wondrous was the victory tree. Wondrous notice. And I was stained by sins. Notice the juxtaposition. The tree is wondrous, full of wonder, and I stained by sins, wounded with guilt. I saw the tree of glory. Here's that wonder idea again. I saw the tree of glory, uh, honored in garments. Honored, like glorified in garments. Shining with joy. Shining. Well, what kind of things tend to shine? What is one thing that causes things to shine? Light. What else? I mean, you have to have light shining on it. There must be light present on it in order for it to shine. If it's really dark like this, things shine. What else? If it's wet. If it's moist, anything will shine. Even something dull will shine if it's wet and there's light. Okay, it won't shine in the dark. So, this is shining with joys, bedecked with gold. Gems had covered worthily the Creator's tree. Now, the speaker, I think, there is probably talking about after Christ is removed. He's talking about the tree after Christ's body has been taken off. What did people do to it? They covered it with gems and gold. And yet beneath that gold, that is, the tree isn't made of gold. The cross is not made of solid gold. Beneath the gold, underneath the plating, what? I began to see an ancient, wretched struggle when it first began to bleed on the right side. The tree starts to bleed. Well, what's the ancient struggle? Crucifixion. Is it Christ fighting the cross? No. Is it him struggling for air? Or is the ancient wretched struggle even oh. more ancient than that? Is that really a struggle in Christian theology? No, because God's going to win. What is Satan to God? <laughs> a mere nuisance, you know, in, in traditional Christian theology. 
Okay? Who is quote unquote Satan's equal? Not Christ, by the way. Michael. It's the Archangel Michael. Okay? So let me let's go on a little bit and then we'll kind of work our way back. So the ancient wretched struggle when it first began to bleed on the right side. Why does the cross start to bleed on the right side? Is it literally the cross's blood? No. It's Christ's blood pouring down on the side. I was all beset with sorrows, fearful for that fair vision. In other words, he's lying there dreaming. He's like, what the hell does this mean? Why me, Lord? I saw that eager beacon change garments and colors. Does that mean he sees the cross go, excuse me a minute, run off behind a tree, you know, and do an actor's quick change? No. He sees it do what? Change garments and colors. Now it was drenched, stained with blood, now be decked with treasure. Is it like a, one of those hologram things? You change it just slightly and you see something else? Or is he seeing the exact same thing from two kind of like different perspectives? Is the blood on the cross at one and the same time? Also, the treasure that adorns the cross. That's a question. That's not a statement. Is it? Okay. Or is he seeing at times the cross covered in golden gems and at other times the cross dripping with blood and sweat? I think it's both. I think it's both readings. Okay. He says, and yet lying there a long while, I beheld in sorrow the Savior's tree, until I heard it utter a sound that best of wood began to speak words. So he sees this, and it's kind of like it, you know, it goes back and forth. He sees the cross, maybe as he would see a cross in church, adorned in gold. And he sees the cross, maybe as he would see the cross if he had been present at the crucifixion, with blood literally dripping off of it, okay? And he hears the cross speak. It was long ago. <laughs> How old is this cross? When's he dreaming? Well, if we take this, the date of the physical rubble cross, roughly 700 years ago, okay? It was long ago, I remember it still that I was felled from the forest edge, ripped up from my roots. Now you notice, this is not a metaphorical cross speaking. This is what? A piece of wood saying, I remember, damn it, when they cut me down. Strong enemy sees me there, made me their spectacle, made me bear their criminals. What's the made me, made me imply? Coercion. Coercion. I didn't want to. I was happy just being a stupid tree out in the woods. <laughs> Made me bear their criminals. They bore me on their shoulders, set me on a hill. Enemies enough fixed me fast. Then I saw. Okay, so the cross is implied. And I was still living then, kind of like I'm still living now. Then I saw the Lord of mankind hasten eagerly when he wanted to ascend upon me. So I'm going to erase all of this because i got to get something else up here. The Lord of mankind. Notice, how is Christ described here? Not the Lord of mankind part. The next the part that comes after that. He hastened eagerly when he wanted to ascend upon me. What's that telling us about Christ? He's willing. He's willing. Yes. So when he says, like, when the cross is speaking, he says, made me their spectacle, made me bear their criminals, it's like the opposite of what Christ was doing because he was saying, like, Christ wanted to be made a spectacle and he wanted to be put bear the criminals and bear mankind. Yes. So like, it's the opposite. Yes. Okay. But hold that idea in your mind because we're going to come back to it a little bit. He wanted, notice, to ascend upon me. All right. I did not dare to break or bow down against the Lord's word. 
The cross is implying I maybe wanted to. I wanted to break, break in two. Why? I don't want the Lord of mankind nailed upon me or to bow down. But he dared not do that against what? Against the Lord's word. Well, why not? No, I mean, that's possible, but I don't think that's what he's getting at. What kind of relationship is he talking about between himself and the Lord? What is he, the cross, to the Lord? He's subject to his will. Subject to his will. He's obedient. He's obedient. He's part of all of the Lord's creation. Okay. Oh, servant. Servant? Put that in a Germanic context. Thane. And this is his Lord. Okay? Thanes don't disobey lords. I should put this up. Fourfold. Germanic ethic. This comes from a writer named C.L. Rand, English guy. Study of Old English. A study of Old English. This is kind of the central belief system of the Germanic peoples. One, duty to Lord. Two, duty to kin. Three, um, duty that's a D, to avenge one's Lord and or kin. And four, Reliance or acceptance of weird. Okay? So, duty to your Lord or kin means you obey them. Right? Notice, I dare not break or bow down against the Lord's word. Can't go against his Lord. When I saw the ends of the earth tremble. Well, what's the ends of the earth tremble? What happened when Christ was crucified, according to the Gospels? Earthquake. This is after he's already nailed. All right? He goes on. Easily I might have felled all those enemies, yet fast I stood. Now, I, I love that line because it's so ambiguous. What's he mean? Yeah, I could have taken it off. <laughs> Romans and Jews, you know, gone all Yoda Count Dooku, you know, <laughs> the cross doing jujitsu on him. Not sure what he means, but he implies I could have taken them all out. Then the young hero made ready. Lord of mankind. Next time he's referred to the Y O U N G. The young hero made ready. That was God Almighty. What's the difference between the young hero and God Almighty? Jesus is God made man. Okay, Jesus is God made man. What's the poet doing? He's kind of going through his mental checklist of correct doctrine and going, uh, well, let's come back down here. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten, begotten of the Father before all ages, light of light, oh, there it is, very God of very God. Or in some translations, true God of true God. Exact same thing as God. How do we know? Begotten, not many, of one essence with the Father. Made of the same stuff that is not made, in essence. Okay? So, young hero, however, is not all this stuff, right? The young hero is like a, I don't know, 20, 25, or in this case, 33-year-old <laughs> Germanic hero. He's portraying Christ as what? A warrior. A Germanic warrior. He is not being portrayed as the late Middle Ages, namby pamby, prissy little uh, suffering, you know, 
white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Jesus. Okay. He what? The young hero made ready, strong and resolute. Firm of mind. He ascended on the high gallows. Notice, he's not passively nailed to it. He does what? He gets up on it. You and me, buddy. We got a date with destiny. You know? And it's like he climbs up on the gallows. Brave in the sight of many when he wanted to ransom mankind. I trembled when he embraced me. And a lot of people have, in my mind, foolishly looked at that word embraced. And they say, oh, Christ is like having a, some weird love sexual thing with the cross. And they say, oh, the cross is Christ's feminine side. Morons. Just morons. Anyways, I trembled when he embraced me, but I dared not bow to the ground. Why? Because this is how things are set. I was reared as a cross. Reared. It's literally, I was raised up. Because reared, modern English can sometimes imply what? Like I was born to be, I was raised to be a cross. The cross is simply saying, I was turned from my normal natural wooden tree self to being this thing. I raised up the, oh, there we go, another one, the mighty king. What's the next? The Lord of heaven, okay? This is on this side, earthly. This is on this side, heavenly. Or this is God, and this is man. All right. I raised up the mighty king, the Lord of heaven. I dare not lie down. They drove dark nails through me. Well, notice what they went through first. You know, The scars are still visible. It's kind of like when Jesus says to Thomas, come on. The cross is going, they're here. Open wounds of hate. I dare not harm any of them. Again, he said this how many times? I could have harmed the harmers of the Lord, but I chose not to. They mocked us both together. I was all drenched with blood, flowing from that man's side after he had sent forth his spirit. Well, when does that happen? Into thy hands I commend my spirit. He dies. Much have I endured on that hill of hostile fates. I saw the God of hosts, what? Cruelly stretched out. Oh, how does that happen, really? How does the God of hosts, he who the Old Testament tell us, tells us is uncircumscribed, he who made everything, how do you stretch that out? Hmm. Darkness had covers with its clouds, The ruler's corpse. How does God die? <laughs> that shining radiance. Shadows spread gray into the clouds. All creation wept, mourned the king's fall. Christ was on the cross. Now, this is the thematic center of the poem. It's not the literal center of the poem. It's the thematic center of the poem. Christ was on Rhoda. Is the old English. And yet from afar men came hastening. No, shut up. Men came hastening. I lost my place. To that noble one, I watched it all. Who are the men who come from afar? How far do they come? Well, if you're the cross, over there is far. What do they do? They came hastening. I was all beset with sorrow, yet I sank into their hands humbly eagerly. Why? Because they take the cross down. What do they do? There they took Almighty God. If he's so almighty, how can he be taken? There they took Almighty God, 
lifted him from his heavy torment. The warriors then left me standing, drenched in blood, all shot through with arrows. They laid him down, bone weary, and stood by his body's head. Let's just use this part. Body's head. So they laid Almighty God down. They watched the Lord of Heaven there, who rested a while. Lord of Heaven. What does it mean he rested a while? Is he just catching 40 weeks? Is he just like, you know, Dan, what's his name in the, um, Dan Brown in his silly novels? Is he just mostly dead? Does he need Miracle Max to come pop a pill in his mouth? And, you know, <laughs> to live. <laughs> Who rested a while weary from his mighty battle. They did what? They began to build a tomb for him in the sight of his slayer. Well, what's the tomb? According to the Gospel of John, Joseph and Nicodemus come take the body down, and they do what? They put it in an already carved tomb. Where? Near the crucifixion. Right? They carved it from bright stone set within the Lord of Victories. Lord of victories. But they're putting him in a grave. He's dead. How victorious is that? Mm -hmm. hmm. They began to sing a dirge for him, Richard, at evening. Why? Because this is Anglo-Saxon mentality. Do we have any accounts in the Gospels of the disciples, you know, getting on horseback and riding around the tomb? No. no. It's not there, but that is Anglo-Saxon fashion, okay? So the poet includes that. That's why you see Renaissance paintings, medieval paintings, Giotto and such, paintings that have, you know, people at the foot of the crucifixion, and how are they all dressed? Well, if the painter is in Florence, they look like Florentines. If the paper, painter is from Venice, they look like Venetians, okay? If they're Rome, they look like Romans, Clothing and all. So they sing the dirge, and then they desire to travel hence. They weary from the glorious Lord. He rested there with little company. Little company. Lycotes. How little was his company? He's all alone. Right? And as we stood there, that is, we, the crosses, a long while fixed in our station, the song ascended from those warriors. The corpse grew. Oh. Kind of safe to do this. Corpse. What does that mean? Not resting. Not merely resting. Corpse is dead, dead. You know, it's that great line from um, The Knight's Tale when old Sir What's His Name dies, and the one guy goes up, you know, the. the um, the spirits fled, but the stench remains as the body starts to rot and such. So the corpse grew cold, the fair life house. Then they began to follow us all to the earth, a terrible fate. They dug for us a deep pit, yet the Lord's thanes, friends, found me there, adorned me with gold and silver. You've got a gloss about that. Who are the Lord's thanes? Yeah, I wish I didn't have all this up. The Lord's thanes are St. Helena... Et al. St. Helena, the mother of Constantine the Great. Okay. Who, does this get a date? No, it doesn't. Who, in the early 4th century, okay, has a vision, this is according to the tradition of the church, has a vision, and the vision tells her where you can find the cross of Christ. She goes to Jerusalem with her followers, starts asking questions, and is told, yeah, we know where it is. And she goes and she has this mound dug up, and in this mound are three crosses. Why? Because there were three crosses at the crucifixion. Okay? And she's kind of like, well, how do I know which one is which? Because none of them have that sign put, printed at the top, King of the Jews, written in Latin, Greek, and Aramaic. 
that part is missing. So she talks to the local bishop of Jerusalem, and he says, here's how we'll find out which one is the real one. I will hold it up, and we'll bring the ill, the sick, the lame, to come fall under the shadow of the cross, thinking what happens in the book of Acts when people come and ill people and come under Peter's shadow. They are healed. He says, if it worked for Pete, it'll work for us. Holds the cross, and they bring these lame and sick, and when they fall or come under the shadow of one cross, they're miraculously healed. Must be the true cross, okay? That's the story behind that. So, they do what? They take the cross and adorn it with gold and silver. That's why, at the beginning of the poem, he sees the cross adorned with gold and gems, okay? Now, how is the speaker still talking at this point? He's saying, long ago, this is everything he said thus far, is when? In the past. Long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, you know, etc. Then what does the speaker of the cross do? Now. Now. You can hear, my dear hero. Who's the hero? The guy, the, the guy having the dream. Now you can hear, my dear hero, that I have endured the work of evildoers, harsh sorrows. Now the time has come that far and wide they honor me. They who? Men over the earth and all this glorious creation and pray to the sign. What's the sign? The cross. The cross. Okay. So... The speaker speaks in kind of sections. I'm going to give you a history lesson first. Gives the history lesson. Tells us what happened. And then he jumps to the present. This is what's going on right now. On me, the Son of God, suffered for a time. Well, there we hear it. But just, you know, laying right out. Son of God. Hmm. Well, that's both God, divine, and earthly. Man, suffered for a time, and so glorious now, I rise up under the heavens. Notice he doesn't say, and so glorious now, he has ascended. No, the cross is saying, look at me. Literally, the cross is saying, look at me. Why? Because I, so glorious now, I rise up under the heavens, and am able to heal each of those who is in awe of me. Why did early Christians adopt the cross as their symbol? Why did they put it on things? Why did they wear it around themselves? Why do Christians in Egypt today, Coptic Christians, wear a little cross tattoo on their wrist? This is their way of quote-unquote witnessing. It's also their way of saying, you can kill me, but I'm not going to give up my faith. He says, once, when, back then, I was made into the worst of torments. And I don't think many people would want to die by the cross. Most hateful to all people. Because it was like for the lowest of the low. It was the most vile form of punishment. Before I opened the true way of life for speech bearers. The cross opened the true way of life? Well, what does St. Paul says? No life without the cross. <laughs> it opened heaven up, essentially. So, lo, the king of glory, guardian of heaven's kingdom, honored me over all the trees of the forest, just as he has also, almighty God, honored his mother, Mary herself, above all man, womankind for the sake of all men. So was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became man. So he's just kind of kicked off another little theological box. He's making sure he's got his doctrinal ducks in order, or in order. So, now I bid you, past, present, what is going on, and then what? 
I bid you means what? What does bid mean? I ask you. That's the... That's the passive way of bid. What's an, what's an active form of bid? Command. I charge you. All right? My beloved hero, that you what? Reveal this vision to men. Don't keep it to yourself. <clears throat> Tell them in words that it is the tree of glory on which Almighty God suffered for mankind's many sins in Adam's ancient deeds. Let's see. We heard Mary. Oh, yeah. And was crucified for us, suffered, pretty clear, right? Buried, yep, that happened. Haven't gotten to this part, have we? Okay. It is the tree of glory on which Almighty God suffered for mankind's many sins and Adam's ancient deeds, back there in the garden. Death he tasted there, there's a buried, still. Yet the Lord, oh, there it is, rose again. On the third day, rose again, according to the scriptures, and he goes on. With his great might to help mankind, he ascended into heaven and ascended into heaven. Okay. He will come again to this middle earth to seek mankind on doomsday. He shall come in glory to, not Jude the living, judge the living. Okay. Da, 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 da. On doomsday, the Lord himself, his angels with him, he will judge, he has the power of judgment. Each one of them as they have earned beforehand here in this, and there's that word again, Lana Leva, in this lone life. Right? Or transitory, or changing, or impermanent, or fleeting, or no one there, there where? Judgment day. No one there may be unafraid at the words which the ruler will speak. He will ask before the multitude where the man might be who for the Lord's name would taste bitter death as he did earlier on that tree. In other words, did you take up your cross? Did you take up your cross? You didn't? But they will tremble then, that is, people at the judgment day, and little think what they might even begin to say to Christ. They're going to go, you know, I, but no one there need be very afraid who has borne in his breast the best of beacons. If you've worn the cross around your neck. That's one meaning of that. Born in his breast, though, means, but taking it beyond merely physically wearing a cross, right? Because, I mean, just look at our quote-unquote celebrities, who wear crosses. I don't think the speaker here would say, you know, they're doing it rightly. Because what does it mean? To wear it externally, the speaker is suggesting what? It means to bear it in the breast, not on the breast. Okay? No one who's born his breast, the best of beacons, but through the cross shall seek the kingdom every soul from this earthly way whoever thinks to rest with the ruler. You want to get there? You want to find that place of stability that the wanderer talks to? Well, there's a way you get there. You follow the cross, because what does the cross become? It's almost like, I'm not saying it is. Okay, notice my language. It's almost like Bifrost. The road, the path in Norse mythology that leads to Asgard, the realm of the gods. Okay. The cross does what? If you're lay, lying on the ground and you see this big cross, what do you see it do? It takes you from here to there. It becomes like the ladder Jacob sees when he falls asleep. And he sees heaven open, and he sees angels ascending and descending. The tree stops speaking. The vision of the rude okay, speaking ends. Then I prayed. Notice this is now the dreamer. Then I prayed to the tree with a happy heart, eagerly. There where I was alone with little company. How little company? 
as little as Christ had in the tomb, he's by himself. My spirit longed to start on the journey forth. What journey forth? To heaven. How? Is he going to go find somebody to kill him? <laughs> Is he going to go do, you know, death by saint slash death by cop? No. He's going to start doing what the cross told him to do. All right? It has felt so much of longing. There is an idea that both the wanderer and the seafarer both mention. Bede mentions it. Okay. This idea of longing, of a desire that's not been met, not been fulfilled. It is now my life's hope that I may seek the tree of victory alone more often than all men and honor it well. He doesn't mean that I alone will be the only one to seek your life because it's mine, you know, <laughs> me and Jesus together. Not what he means. He means alone how? Without company. Without company. Where is this? Does the seafarer have company when he's out in his little boat? No. no, he's off by himself. The wanderer is off by himself. Each one of these is, is indicating something like, and again, I don't know that this is exactly what is intended. I kind of think it is. But something like the desert ascetics or... The desert fathers of the early church, like St. Anthony the Great, the first of the monks, the guy who founded monasticism. Well, what did he do? He was rich. He was a doctor, pharmacist. One day he was walking, and he heard in a church, he heard the words of the gospel, go and sell all that you have and follow me. And that kind of bugged him. And so he goes and sells everything that he has, lit, sets a pot aside for his sister. His parents are dead so that she can be well cared for, sells everything he has, and he goes off into the desert and lives alone for 20 years. Right? We just read this life of St. Anthony, and people start coming to him because they, you know, think he's a wise man, blah, 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 blah. Gets, I think that's what he means, because that may be what the seafarer is talking about. This idea of going off and doing what? Ascetic, for lack of a better word. Testing, I mean, he talks about testing himself, proving himself. We know from things that are written, St. Guthlac, okay, old English saint, would go and stand out in the North Sea up to his chin for hours on end. Just as a means of testing himself. This is, this is his way of going, yeah, I can do this, I'm a big tough guy. No, it's because he was saying he was putting his faith in Christ that Christ would protect him. I mean, Daniel in the lion's den kind of thing. Three, you know, use in the fiery furnace kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, anchorite, the term, refers to monks, right? So, he says, uh, alone all the men, I wish for that with all my heart, and my hope of protection is fixed on the cross. I have few wealthy friends on earth. Now that's probably again Lytotes. How many wealthy friends? Yeah. He's got nobody. And he doesn't just mean, you know, the 1%. He means probably by wealthy friends. I don't have a Lord. This guy may be like the wanderer, like the seafarer. I have few wealthy friends on earth. Why? They all have gone forth. They're dead. Fled from worldly joys, sought the king of glory. They live now in heaven with the high father. Now there's a very dramatic phrase. <laughs> like, they live in heaven with Odin. <laughs> and dwell in glory. And each day I look forward to the time when the cross of the Lord, in which I have looked while here on this earth, will fetch me from this lonely life. Like Jesus is going to go, cross, go get Fred. You know, he's ready, he's done, you know. Will fetch me from this lonely life and bring me where there is 
great bliss. Joy in heaven, where the Lord's host is seated at the feast with ceaseless bliss. What is he metaphorically, well, let me rephrase that. What is he in a dramatic context talking about? The hall. The hall. I mean, this is Valhalla. Only thing is, it's not the hall of the slain. Valhalla. It's what? It's the hall of the blessed. It's, it's Dramhalla. It's the hall of joys. Okay? Lifhalla. The hall of life. The poet keeps taking these Germanic images and doing what with them? He's baptizing them. He's doing exactly what St. Gregory the Great told Augustine to do when he gets into England. Okay? Take all their pagan stuff, make it Christian. Okay? So, he says, this great bliss, joy in heaven, were the Lord's host. That's the Lord's, his, um, his posse. His posse comicatus. Okay? We think that's, oh, that's, you know, good old American Western. Yeah. No, that's Anglo-Saxon. Idea of the posse comicatus. That is the Lord's group of things. Okay? Where the Lord's host is seated at the feast, notice they're at the table. People want a place at the table, so to speak. This is where you get one. With ceaseless bliss, death and ever end. And then set me where I may afterwards dwell in glory, have a share of joy, fully with the saints. May the Lord be my friend. Okay. You can use the same word there for Lord and the friend. May the friend be my friend. May the Lord be my Lord. It's possible to do that. May the Lord be my friend who? He who here on earth once suffered, we're back kind of like the Apostles, the Nicene Creed, who once suffered on the hanging tree for human sin. He ransomed us and gave us life, a heavenly home. Hope was renewed with cheer and bliss for those who were burning there. Those who were burning where? In well, hell. In hell. Your gloss tells you, a well-known Christian tradition known as the harrowing of hell tells how Jesus, after his death on the cross, descended into hell. Yeah, it's not in this version. Some versions of the Nicene Creed say, um, was buried, descended into hell, and on the third day rose again. Well, what did he, why did he descend into hell? He's just checking things out? Making sure it's being run well, you know. Yeah, he went down there to save. And in the early tradition of the church, all the way up to 20th century, okay, there are writers who said that what Christ did in the harrowing of hell is he went and he broke open the gates of hell. Dante plays with this, for example, in the Divine Comedy. He he doesn't just go down and go. Uh, Satan, can I, can I come in? I need to get some people out. And he opens the door, and you know, people line up. He goes, uh, Adam, yep, yeah, you're in. Moses, yep, you're in. David, yep, yeah, you're in. Samson, you know, okay, yeah, you're in. <laughs> what he does, according to these writers, is he destroys the gates of hell. There, there are no gates of hell, these writers say, anymore. Now, if you think about that for a moment, from a theological perspective, that's pretty mind-blowing. There's not enough duct tape in the world to keep your mind together. Because <laughs> what does that mean from that moment on? Saints can enter and exit as they please. Well, not necessarily as they please. It's not like, you know, you get tired of heaven. And, I'm going to go out to hell for a few days. You know, have a weenie roast, you know. <laughs> not that kind of thing. But it is the opposite. The only people who are in hell are those who want to be in hell. Those who choose to be in hell. Why? Because the gates are open. It's like being going to prison and not having any doors on the cells. How many people would go, should I? Because <laughs> there's, you know, it's not like the guards waiting outside. Right? So notice what he says. 
Hope was renewed with cheer and bliss for those who were burning there. Okay. Well, who were those who were burning there? All the people who had died before the church. Everybody who had died before Christ. Okay. And the early church often took that to mean everybody. Adam. I mean, there's a great Middle English um, song. We're not doing it because we don't have time. Called Adam lay e bounded. Adam lay e bounded for 4,000 winters long. Bound. Tied up. In hell. He was just waiting. And Jesus came and untied him and took him off. Right? Some people take the harrowing of hell to mean Jesus only went down to get those who were quote unquote saved. Because not everybody is saved according to, for example, um, most Calvinists, that most you know, Christian thought. So hope was renewed. The sun was successful in that journey, mighty and victorious. When he came with a multitude, a great host of souls, into God's kingdom. The one ruler almighty, the angels rejoicing, all the saints already in heaven, dwelling in glory. When almighty God, their ruler, almighty God, I mean, sums it all up. So what you had going on here was the poet emphasizing Christ is whom? God. God. Christ is human. Why would the poet want to emphasize that? Is it merely because of this? Notice, one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible. It's a pretty short clause. That's the beginning. And then one more, Jesus Christ. And then this thing, y'all. This goes all the way to here. It's the big portion of the creed. Creed merely means I believe. Credo. That's what all that means. Okay. So why is he emphasizing this so much? Well, a couple of possible reasons. Both have to do somewhat with the purpose of the poem. Okay? Why does the author, whoever it is, write this poem? It's obviously didactic, right? I mean, he's obviously trying to teach something. Okay? There are two dates in the church calendar where the cross is celebrated. One is September 14th. And the other one is during what's called Great Lent. And the date of this one depends upon which branch of the church you're in, whether you're in the Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, which at this time, they're one. There's no split between, quote-unquote, Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. That occurs in 1054. That's after this poem is written. Okay? But even there, there's a difference between the Eastern Church celebrates some of the events in Lent, and when the Western Church does, okay? But it's one of the Sundays during Great Lent. This is called the Exaltation of the Cross, okay? And this one is, it's almost the same, but it's something slightly different. So it could be that the poem is written kind of as a commemoration of one of those two days. Could be. But bear in mind, the cross, the actual physical cross we talked about, the real cross, dates from somewhere around 700 to 725. How close is that to the Roman Christianization of the Anglo-Saxons? It's roughly plus 100 years. That's not that long. Okay. That's... Closer in time than we are to Lincoln. It's closer in time than we are to, you know, uh, the year 1900, just about. All right? So that's, I mean, that's not that long. So the poem could also be written as an exhortation to adopt the faith. Or as a reinforcement of the faith. And one of the reasons it could be that, one of the reasons it's read as working like that possibly, is because what does the poet do in the poem? The poet, I mean, it's about what? Is it about a quote-unquote native Germanic or Old English topic? Yeah. No, it's about Christianity. It's about the cross of Christ. It's a guy who died way over in the Middle East a long time ago has nothing to do with the Germanic tradition. And so he takes that and does what with it? He uses Germanic imagery. He uses Germanic imagery. He portrays Christ as what? Germanic hero. 
He portrays Christ's followers as what? His loyal fans. Okay. But he then has one other problem. Germanic lords aren't supposed to die. That's not how you win victory for your people. You win victory by, for your people by killing the other guys and then distributing you know, their treasure off to your people. So he's got to... He's got to modify that image somewhat. So he portrays Christ as this Germanic hero who gains his victory how? By dying. But he's this Germanic hero who is also God. Okay? And it could be that he really hammers home the God-man nature or idea of Christ, the two natures of Christ, because there might be an undercurrent, let's say, of a heresy flowing around in Anglo-Saxon England sometime in the early 7th century. And that heresy would be, anybody know what it might be? Something that has to do with the nature of Christ as being both God and man. It's the Arian heresy, named after a priest named Arius who lived in North Africa in the early 4th century. Okay? Arius taught that Jesus wasn't God. That the Son of God was not God. He said, famously, there was a time when the Son of God was not. Okay? So, and he started to get followers. Now, he thought he was protecting God's divinity. Right? So, Constantine the Great, Emperor, in 325 convenes a council. It's called the Council of Nicaea. That's why this thing is called the Nicene Creed. And at this council, bishops from all the churches attend. It's called the First Ecumenical Council. It's ecumenical because bishops from all the churches attend. It's not ecumenical because the Protestants, you know, the Church of Christ, the Baptist, Methodist, because none of those exist <laughs> back then. Show up. It's because bishops from all the churches exist. Come in. And they all go up, go go to this council for one thing. It's not to have a vote. It's not to have Arius stand up, declare what he believes, and have an opponent of Arius stand up and declare what he believes, and okay, let's take a vote on it. Let's see who, who wins this. No. The purpose of the council is to prove to Arius that he is wrong. Arius can stands up. He gives his viewpoint. Other people defend the other perspective, which is that the Nicene Creed. Okay. That's what comes out. But the view they are, they are supporting is Jesus is very God of very God. That's why it has that one phrase of one essence. Homo usius. That means one essence. Arius says, no, it's homo, sorry, homo usius. It's got two O's. Arius said the Greek word should be something like this. I'm not remembering the exact spelling. Homo e usius. The, little, the letter I there, it means like. Okay, what does like always mean? Not quite. <laughs> Not the same. This means same essence. This one means like the same essence. Okay? The whole purpose of this council was to determine who is Christ, or was to assert who is Christ. Okay? So it was argued, Christ is very God of very God, of, of one essence, begotten of the Father before our worlds, you know, all this kind of stuff, okay? The poem really seems 
to be hammering this idea home. Human, God. Earthly, divine. Man, God. Dead, alive. Again and again and again. So that some of us think <coughs> the poet knows there's an issue kind of going around and he's working on getting his hearers what? Theologically in line. To get them so that the cross can be what? Can be that opening. Can be that door. All right? Because this time period, right belief was important. Not, it's, it tends not to be as much in our society because our society essentially says, hey, whatever you want. Anglo-Saxon time, Christian Anglo-Saxon time, not so much. <laughs> it's more, no, you got to believe the right things. Why? Because, you know, as a man believes, so he does kind of a thing. If you don't have the right belief, you're not going to have the right, well, what do the wanderer and the seafarer both point to? The ultimate destination. Okay? Okay, well, stop there. We're a day behind in the syllabus, and we're starting... The thing I usually go on and on about, um, Beowulf. So I will more than likely drop something.